you want to start? Yeah, sure. Yes. Hi, I'm Giannis. I'm a local since uh, 2007. I've um, yes. been working with a uh, few folks primarily on the online presence for uh, I don't know, three or four years now. Yeah. So, great. So, good to see you. See you. Uh, Max, I'm a, a venue manager down on the east side for a new emerging venue called Secret Theater. Oh, um, yes. Uh, Mark? Uh, known and Ron for around uh, four or five years. Yep. And uh, we're hardcore fuse box attendees. Uh, and I also organized the Quantified Self Meetup. It happens in the same space about every other month. Amazing. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mick. Uh, uh, I'm Mick. 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 I'm John. I was here at the first meetup, and uh, you know, finally made it past. Yeah. I'm on the technology side. Great. Good to see you. I'm Caroline. This is my first meeting. Uh, I'm a digital graphic designer. Oh, cool. Yeah. Thanks for coming. I am Julie, and I uh, am currently doing a project um, with uh, actually uh, senior citizens that travel in RVs. Um, it's collaborative. Uh, Media work, and um, this is my first meeting. I'm particularly, really fascinated about what you're doing. Oh, cool. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Nikki. I'm a designer, also in the digital space, and I work at Fifty Point Three. Um, so I'm, you know? <laughs> yes. um, I'm, I'm fairly new there, but I'm Stephanie, a UX UI designer in town, and Hey, thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, I'm Ollie. I went to the first couple of meetups when they were still at MicroSquare, um, but I'm interested in uh, analytics and data visualization. Uh, my name's Paul. I, it's my first year, and I'm a motion designer. Oh, cool. Great. I'm Ramona. I'm a creative director. Um, I work with engineers in the energy industries, and I really like coming to the meetups and learning all about the cool stuff that's happening and out there. Uh, I'm Laurie Frick. I'm a data artist, and you'll hear more. <laughs> um, I'm Robin. I do uh, Salesforce administration for a local nonprofit. Paris, uh, I'm an audio engineer. Awesome. Okay. Hey there, come on in. We just introduced everyone, so uh, I'm Jonathan. Hey, thanks for coming. <laughs> hey. So, um, uh, one of the things we sort of discussed really early on was you know, what's happening in Austin, what's not, and uh, one of the things that kind of emerged was, well, it'd be great if there was uh, a sort of regular uh, guest artist series as part of this meetup. Um, we're hoping to eventually make this into also a national and perhaps international sort of speaker series, but we wanted to start with the local scene, what's happening here, really getting a better understanding of the landscape, who's working in, in this space right now. There's, I mean, there's just the art and technology landscape is huge. There's a lot of different uh, ways that people are engaging in this space. Um, and so it's it's been, in some ways, a kind of celebration of what's happening locally and also a kind of a research phase of letting us all as a group and community kind of getting to, to tap in and plug into what's happening and who's doing what here. Um, and I was so excited that Lori was able to do this. I'm a huge fan of her work. Uh, she's really brilliant. She will all experience her brilliance in just a moment. Um, and so she's gonna, she has like a 20 yeah, minute, 20 minute, yeah. 20 minute presentation yeah. uh, and we'll open it up for a few questions uh, and then we can hang out and shoot, shoot the breeze. Um, how's that sound? Good? Yay. Yes. <laughs> you know, I brought these little, I brought the, I'll do this first. They're little cards and they're like little trading cards. I think awesome. I have enough. Wow. Can I pick which one I want? Mm -hmm. It's a mistake. 
It was all good, and then I touched it. We're gonna need help. Can you go get someone? Um, it auto detected before. Well, there's a little thing that says plug it in. This goes back here to this. It's number two. And you do this, and you go number two. That might be enough. And here you have to turn on that. Okay. All right. Great. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, don't touch it. <laughs> I was going to bring it closer so I could stand here and it would all be good. All right. Have you ever thought about um, what's known about you? Not just, yeah, 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 I Google myself and what do people see and, you know, what have I posted lately? But, you know, some of this, you know, like every time you drive through the Easy Pass line or, um, every credit card transaction over the last year, or every movie you've downloaded. Right. You start thinking about, right, everything. I um, um, started thinking about, right, data about you, and I started making a list. It was a few years ago, and every few days, I'd, uh, I'd think of something new. And it really wasn't very long ago I realized, for example, that Amazon knows how fast I read a book. <laughs> because of Kindle. They know if I cheat, if I read the end. Right? And so you really think about it's your personality, it's what you like, it's all the money you spend, it's how you write, right? You know, you have a, you know, I've worn a watch that keeps track of my heart rate. I mean, you start realizing um, in some ways it's actually a more compelling, more complex, more interesting picture of me than I can even remember about myself. And so that's kind of the beginning. You know, I'm on a mission to get you to think about your data in a whole new way. And uh, I think it's going to turn out completely different than people expect. And, I, I, and so you know, the next you know, few minutes, the talk is to basically persuade you of that idea. So I'm a data artist. I make um, handout work from usually self-tracking data. Um, normally, it's my data, but I use all kinds of human data. And um, I had a background in tech, completely switched, you know, more than 10 years ago, completely switched, went back to school, and really sort of combined art and technology in a whole kind of compulsive way. Um, so I have kind of a story to walk you through. Um, you know, I didn't just like wake up one day and go, oh, it's really all about the data track. You know, I mean, it all started, the first thing that got me captivated was, I had this sense that something had happened with time. You know, so it all kind of started with time. There was this, um, there was this writer, uh, Linda Stone, and she had described it as, you know, continuous partial, you know, partial attention. It felt like time had really shifted, and everything was in these tiny little bits. And, you know, I started to think about all those little moments of time and what you remember. And, you know, I. Um, I started to make work based on that notion of little bits of time and imagine time and you know how you remember time. And you'll see as I go, I just show my work as I go. So these are all, I don't like dwell on it too much, but you kind of, you let it wash over you. And I used to, um, I, I, I had this, and I still do, I actually think there's something um, Know, kind of magical about 24 hours that you know a perfect painting is like a complete day you know if you think about a whole day there are these real quiet areas when you're sleeping and then you have these sort of ugly you know tense bits or an argument or a little boring part and I thought it was really you know a metaphor for how you spend a day it's like a, you know it's an equivalent of a very very nice painting and I started um to real, you know, to think about, you know, actually really trying to measure time. You know, I'd learned from my tech background. If you really want to understand something, if you really want to study, you should measure it. 
And I uh, started keeping track of my time, but it's incredibly hard. So I Googled it, and I found um, this guy, Ben Lipkowitz. And Ben had been measuring his time 24 hours a day. Every single one of these horizontals is a is the 24 hours of time, and he, you know, color categorized it, and he's done this for years. And I was like, holy shit, it looks exactly the way I'd imagine time, is these little tiny bits. And it's like, all right, I've got somebody that's really measuring real time. And I didn't even hesitate. I scooped it up and started making drawings from it. Steal like an artist. <laughs> and I started chopping it up and you know making pieces based on, um, he sleeps on a 26 hour cycle, so you get these beautiful diagonal, right? So every day, you know, he pops in a new one, a new, you know, new 24 hours. But I wanted to measure something about my time. And um, and I knew from a tech background that a lot of these things about you know manually measuring yourself is just going to get easier. Sensors are going to get really small. You know, tattoos. You know, Google's got a contact lens. I mean, there's lots and lots of things that are beginning to measure you very accurately and are going to be really simple. Um, and at this point, it was a couple. You know, it was a few years ago. I um, I decided I could measure my time while I slept. <laughs> And I got this Zio, which is a, it's a dry EEG sensor, and you wear it at night, and it's a really accurate way to measure sleep. Uh, deep sleep, REM sleep, light sleep, every time you wake up. And um, you know, sleep starts to look like these vertical. So every single night of sleep is one of these next to each other. And I started to make drawings from my sleep. And one of the things was like, sleep is not so different than waking. It's all these little five and 10 minute bits. And I was kind of surprised because, um, I, you know, I always read sleep is in these 90 minute cycles. I thought you had these big chunks of sleep and the truth is you don't, you have all these little pieces. There's a cycle in it, but it's in all these little pieces. And um, it was one of the first times that I'd really measured something kind of unconscious about myself. And I was, I was a little surprised um, because I had, you know, I go to bed, I wake up in the morning, you know, eight hours later. I was pretty good about making sure I got a full night's sleep. Um, but it turns out I'm not a very good sleeper. And I had always thought I was like a really good sleeper. And so it was the first time I had to kind of confront the data that I really wasn't the person I thought I was. It was a little different than I'd imagined. And it just, it was one of those things that kind of hooked me. It was, both, it was both a little depressing and a little worried, you know, it was a little like, oh, you know where you, life goes along and all of a sudden you get this, whoa, it's not what I thought it was. Um, but it, so, it, I mean, it was, you know, it was part of the compulsion of it is, so I started to make lots of pieces based on sleep and I created these rule systems. So, and this is the deep sleep is the red and the REM sleep is pink. And I took all the light sleep um, which is kind of known as trash sleep, and I folded it up out of the way. So I got these things that poked out, and um, I put a bunch of this work in a show in Los Angeles at a gallery. And it was kind of a turning point. You know, this was in 2010, 11, 2000, right at the end of 2010, and uh, it, got a, it got a huge review in the Los Angeles Times. And then it got picked up on blogs, and it went on Boing Boing, and it went on Boom, and it got picked up in New Scientist, and it got in tech magazines, and it was, it was like, oh my god. Um, I don't know, people are secure in artists. I mean, getting that kind of, all of a sudden you get this a bunch of press, and it really sort of turned the corner for me. But at the same time, that company that made the little sleep device, they, because I never, I, and I talked about it. I'm using Zio, I'm measuring sleep. And they wrote to me, they, I got a little email from them, Laurie, what can we do to help you? <laughs> and I said, um, I, I'd love more data. They sent me a bunch of these sleep things too, but they, I got a bunch of, it was the first time I could see my data compared to a bunch of other people's data. And so you're, I was, it, it's just tipped the other way. So the purple is the really good stuff, that's deep sleep, and the orange is when you're waking up. And I could see me compared to other people, and I thought, wow, it's like a, it's like a fingerprint. 
It's very identifiable. And I got to know the guy who was the head of research, and we talked about this, and he says, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. People have a very definite, you know, the pattern of their behavior, these unconscious patterns of sleep are really unique to them. And um, so it was about this time, Mark, I, okay, usually I tell this story about my husband, but he's not sitting in the room. Um, <laughs> but I didn't want to be the only one that was, like, getting into bed at night, you know, <laughs> wearing the same thing on my head. So I got one for Mark. Well, I mean, right, okay. So Mark goes, I'm a terrible sleeper. Well, okay, he puts this thing on the first night, and I'm getting scores like in the 60s, 70s, and I figured it went to 100. I thought, I thought it was, you know, on a norm. You know, on a norm. He gets like, I don't know, where's your first score? 130? 134. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit, how did you get so Well, okay, so it turns out um, it's not that you're a bad sleeper. Most of the time you're a really good sleeper, but you only remember the bad. And so Mark's really swings wildly. And mine is pretty narrow and I'm pretty, you know, you know, operate within a pretty narrow range and Mark swings like this and I thought, what if weirdly this measures your personality? And it was it it got it kind of got me to really think about it more than just the data, that there's something that the data has to say about you. And I Kind of at that moment, I decide to just like, let me just measure more. So anything that was like living in the future, anything that was going to be, and it wasn't yet. A lot of things that you measure now are still kind of manual and clunky and watches and Fitbits. And, but anything that was a way to experience what the future will be like, so it was easy. Um, and this is not everything. I measured a lot of things, and I've kept it up. I mean, I got a thousand nights of sleep data, and I've worn a Fitbit for God, I'm now, I've worn a Fitbit for five years. And you know, you get your DNA, and you you know, I had one of these watches that measured your skin. All of these things that you could measure about yourself. And I thought, well, I'm just going to use myself for research. And there's kind of a, a tradition of artists doing this. You know, it's like self-portraiture. And I, um, I kind of had this fantasy, you know, that there's, um, there is a, a, you know, there's, there's some history of artists anticipating a scientific breakthrough. If you really notice, and it's something very real, and an artist really pays attention to it, you know, there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's a whole theory about it, you know, Proust, anyway, um, and memory and all of that. So, um, and I really believed that I could notice something real that would be true. And so I started to really think about the data, and I studied patterns in the data. And at the beginning, I thought I was going to triangulate, figure out cause and effect, and be a good engineer. But humans, it's, you're really noisy, and there's too many variables, and it's really hard to say if you got this much sleep, then you lost this kind of weight, and then you walk this, you know, this many steps, and this is what you ate. Uh, and so I kind of let go of the idea that I could Makes, makes sense of the correlation of the data or the cause and effect of the data, and I started to just see the patterns in the data. And I almost thought they were like um, like neural Fibonacci's, but these unconscious proportions and patterns and the things that you did unconsciously had this sort of humanness to them. And I, I thought of them as, um, it was almost like reflecting something in us. And then if you'd see them, there would be this fluency that you could recognize that it was human, or organic, and this is the way someone operates. And, and, and then I started to think of them as portraits, data portraits. And I thought, well, what if you could put these, so you see this, what if you could see these data portraits as texture? You know, what if you started to think about them in the walls and the spaces that you live, and in the future, they don't have to be handmade. They can be 3D printed or laser cut. You have a big X, Y axis on the wall, and it's, it's physical, and it's real, and it's tangible. But it's keeping track of all these little sensors that are in your clothes and things you swallow and all the stuff that's keeping track of you. And, and it's giving you this portraiture of you live, real time. And I thought, you know, that's, you know, it's, 
it, I started, you know, I started just, you know, it's this idea that I could anticipate the future, and I started to think, what would the future be like? You know, we tend to repeat a lot of our patterns. I've been doing a lot of work lately with time, tracking my own time. There's a lot of time studies. I just went to a big conference on time use and international time use. There's people that study time, and you know, we tend to repeat the patterns, the places that we go. And people think it's boring, but I actually think that intensity of repetition, it's, it's what makes you feel comfortable and human and you know, routines and systems. You know, we get up at the same time, we eat the same kind of foods. We love, I mean, it's really something. Those kinds of things give us a sense of comfort. And I had my studio filled with all these patterns and cut stuff, and I, and I decided, you know, as I'm really trying to notice how does this make me feel, that it felt comfortable. I mean, it felt comforting, soothing, and it felt familiar, it felt like me, and I liked it. I thought it feels recognizable. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe that's the whole point. In the future, all these measurements and all this stuff, and, you know, every time you spend money in your credit card and drive through the easy pass, and every video you've ever seen, and every book you read, and the speed that you turn pages, and the you know, how fast you respond to an email and what kinds of words you use in your text and all these things have this, you know, you can track your sentiment and your mood. It's my, you know, you know, how's my breath today and how many calories. I mean, that all starts to add up to these hidden patterns of you. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe that's the, maybe that's, maybe it's as simple as that. It's your data abstracted and played back to you. You know, maybe it's a shortcut to mindfulness. Technology boosted meditation, mindfulness. Maybe it's this, you know, quick and dirty way to, you know, improve your immune system. It's a way to see yourself in a way, you know, that's sort of like deep breathing, but instead it's all the sensor data on these, you know, patterns and spaces and the walls that I live. You know, and I, th you know, I thought about it. There's some of my background. I spent a lot of time in the neuroscience center. I was a resident at um, UT, the neuroscience research center. And I thought, you know, your brain can't really tell the difference between, you know, you know that, you know, it just it's feeding the sense of you. You know, it doesn't. It can't tell the difference between, um, you know, meditation and a data selfie. It's it just knows that it's feeding the human loop that you need to feel alive. And so, um, you, know, you know, people are buying these pieces, they're taking them home, they're, right, and usually it was my data, but in this case, it's the lobby of a, 1323, it's the lobby of a tech company of a digital shop downtown, and you know, the, the, the whole teams of people all interact in chat rooms, and so we, grabbed all of the chat metadata over a 30-day period and color-coded it by who was talking with who, the length of it, you know, filled the whole lobby. And I I could see that data makes, you know, gets people to really look. You know, you think about all these apps and everything people are using, but art can get you to stop and really pay attention and look at it longer and, and remember it in a different way. And I, you know, part of the exchange with 1323 was trying to get more people to experience this idea of take back your data, your data can be, can be meaningful, the patterns that you go, the places, you know, that you spend time. And Fitbits is an iPhone app, it's live, it's in the App Store, mm -hmm. and it, it just, it keeps track of the places that you go and turns it into pattern. It's as simple as that. It turns it into something that feels like art based on the patterns of your travels. But in some ways, it was really just a simple idea of, you know, take back your data. That it's not just what other people measure about you, but what can you know about yourself? And, um, you know, I'm, I've been working on this for a few years and, uh, and I stopped and I thought, why? We used to, um, I do artist residencies, and maybe you know this, you you have a drink with somebody and you try to analyze somebody based on the work that they make, but we would, um, you know, be like shrinks and look at uh, another artist's work and sort of psychoanalyze them, and I, and I thought, 
if somebody was trying to psychoanalyze me, right? I've got all these sensors on me. <laughs> it's like, Laura, you, you know, she, she's trying to figure out who she is. And I thought, and I, I agree. I think I'm trying to understand who am I? And, you know, I kind of had to give myself a break and to sort of make this make sense. Is I think we're all doing that all the time. You know, it's so hard to see yourself. It's, you know, it's the, it's, the, it's the you that other people see. I mean, sometimes you change jobs, you move apartments, you get a new boyfriend. You, um, you don't know until you try it. Do they like me? Do I like them? Do I like this place? You, it's so hard to anticipate who am I really without getting some kind of external means of understanding who you are. And so yeah, I've got these Fitbits and I've got stuff strapped on me and I'm measuring it. But I think it's, but I think it's something we all need. Like this is this fundamental, like the ability to reveal the hidden part of us, the part that's so hard to see, the part that our friends see or that other people know about us that we can't see about ourselves. It's kind of the reason you don't hear your own heartbeat. You know, you look in the mirror, you really don't see yourself. And it's, yeah, I, I looked at the data and the things that are get, you know, gathered and measured about us. But what if this is this chance to see this part of us that, I, that we don't even, you know, know? And then, you know, you start to think, well, all right, what would your data say about you? Is it going to be like Mark, who's right? swings wildly, sleeps terribly, sleeps great, or me that's sort of narrow. What would your data tell you about yourself? And, and that's what got me to really think that, I, that this debate on privacy is going to get turned upside down. I think rather than people think I'm going to hide, or I don't want to be measured, or I'm going to try to go stealth, or I'm really worried about data collected on me, I think it's going to flip the other way, and we're going to be ravenous for this data about us. I mean, we're going to seriously not be able to get enough. You know, the trick is to be able to get, right, take back your data, to have your data that's measured about you come back to you in some way. And I have this, you know, this fantasy that I can, right, get all of my data. And it's the secret to who am I. I don't really actually think it's that far off. I mean, I don't think we're that far away. There's so much that's measured about us now. This notion that I could get everything that's measured about me and use it as a way to understand who I am. You know, it's the idea of, you know, how am I doing today? Am I up? Am I down? Do I have my mojo? How am I going to feel tomorrow? It's almost like a smart drug. What if I knew tomorrow I've got a big meeting at 11 and 11 is sort of when you know, I can, you know, it's this ability to predict. What if I know I'm going to be in really good, like, mental, physical, I slept, I ate the right amount of calories, I got my protein. I mean, it's the idea that I could actually know how I'm going to, you know, that I'm going to feel. And, I, you know, I, you know, I talk with a lot of people about this, and there's some really interesting teams that are working on data's ability to not just know what you're doing now, but the ability to predict and to understand what's coming next. I mean, not that your fate is sealed, but that, that you'd have some sense of how you're going to feel tomorrow. So I'm right coming down to the end here, finishing it. But it's this idea that self-tracking, measurement, data, and a lot of things about you so, so often gets described as um, fitness or health. Even Apple Watch, when they announced it, they had all these health apps. And I just think to myself, that's not what it's about. I, I think it's about identity. I mean, I think there's a moment where it's going to tip and you start to realize that there's something about it that starts to, to tell us who we are. You know, I imagine that the real motivator is going to be this sort of magic immune system booster, that somehow this data has some sense of you and you get some sense of self and it's like people are not healthier because they run more, but because they see themselves in a, in a more in-depth in way. So data is the way to know who we are and to get to know ourselves. Why are we running from it? So I say, take back your data. Turn it into art. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. I mean, you sort of
to get it, right? It's like, what if, I mean, people are so worried. It's like, no, 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 no. It's going to go the other way. It's super interesting. Well, I, think, I mean, throughout the Iran, there are people worried. You know, the issue for me is, I think it's great, by the way. Uh, you are, it's great, let's use it like that. Um, the interesting issue comes from the you know, social perspective where it's one thing you know in your own debts, but it's another completely different thing from uh, you know, somebody else or corporations knowing your debts and things like that. And, you know, some people have issue with that and who your debt is actually made available to. That's going to be, become a real big issue. I think. You know, pri privacy versus security. Is In some ways, it already is because you have people that, for example, the casinos in Las Vegas have these priming tricks that that get you to stay in the casino longer. You know, like they take away all the clocks, they fill your room with oxygen so you feel more awake, so you go down there. Um, the way that they rearrange grocery stores, like they had did this one experiment. It was uh, years ago, but there was a high quality liquor and a new liquor that came out. It was like whiskey. The, the, the label was better. And for some reason, this high quality liquor that's been on the market for a long, long time, their sales started to drop off and they found out that it was the packaging. So they put all these research and development teams acting and gathering this hidden data about ourselves that they've been using on us since long time. Long time. Right. And so, at least knowing this about yourself, I think sometimes it's one of those things like that radical honesty. Like if you know yourself, it doesn't really matter if anybody else has that same data because you're both have the same perspective of you and who you view this. Right, right. I think the biggest thing right now that people are so pissed off about is it's opaque. You know they're gathering something, you have no idea, you're worried. What they're doing with it. What they're doing with it, it feels, um, it's one sided, it's like a one sided handshake. And so I've talked to some companies, you know, they're not opposed to it. Some of them just don't have the wherewithal. I mean, this is a pretty savvy group to realize that their databases are a mess and they don't have a very, you know, substantive way to take those data and those patterns and give it back to you. But I think it will eventually be like a, like a social contract or like being green or just the way that a company operates, the things that they measure about you, they're not public, but they'll give them back to you. And, and I've had pretty savvy data scientists go, well, what are you gonna do with them? But I think, I think what if there was an app store for 99 cents, I could compare my mood against my spending, or, right, so if I've got data, it's in a standard format, what if that could start to, yeah. Right. I value to your life. I value to your life, but there's also there's an idea that socially, I mean, I understand because you have what you're just stating is the is 99 percent of what gets discussed out there in the world. Yeah. Is that somewhere there's going to be some cultural group, some social group, maybe some country, some place that decides that they're all in on data, and you start to realize you can start to address traffic patterns and health and who gets the flu and where antibiotics are used and you know housing costs and it starts to be all kinds of things that societally it changes yeah. and it's not and this crazy Dave Eggers circle kind of stuff. No, no, sure. I, I, I've been using the sleep cycle app, but um, it sounds like a similar uh, thing to the uh, ZO, yeah. yeah. To the ZO for probably two or three years now. Hmm. And, um, you know, you run on your iPhone, you put it on your pillow. Um, it's remarkable, really. You know, when you look in the morning, it's like, oh, I had, you know, I feel great. Have I got a 96% sleep? <laughs> you know, and it shows on a graph that you go into this deep sleep for a very extended period, and, and you come out of it. Other nights, particularly, you know, you go out and stay out drinking too late. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the percentage is before. It's like, well, it must, it must work, right? But you feel right. like crap the next day, and right. you've got a graph there to show you how little quality sleep you actually have. Right. And it's interesting to, to see, you know, um, over the course of a month or six months, how much pain you've been going to go through. Before that. <laughs> <laughs> I really think this is the last generation for people where that stuff's just unknown. Like, because right now, you don't really know how many calories you exert 
right? But there, there's wearable clothes that are starting to have sensors in them, so you'll actually know how many calories you spent. You'll start to understand your immune system, your microbiome. You'll start to have this data about you and how you're doing in a way that will be unimaginable that it wasn't available. And the question is, how do you sh present that to somebody? And I think you present it like art. It's so fascinating to think about this as like a language, this new language. It's a language. You know, that yeah. like stress. People, people can recognize, oh, yeah, you this can is see it. totally. Oh, I'm having a bad, this is not yeah, good. Yeah, so fascinating, yeah. yeah good. It's not crazy, I could all, I mean, I could, totally. I could walk out of here like having sold you, and then like in yeah. 10 years, you'll go, oh my god, remember we said that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because I keep seeing little pieces of it. Little studies. There was one that just I, we posted on Facebook. It was like if you sleep less than six hours, you get more colds. <laughs> you know. I mean that's true. Yeah, they said that the it was a comparison of six and under versus seven and more, and uh, it was like a four or five times more sensibility or. or Remember that fully that really silly stuff that people go, oh, I went outside and I got cold and I got a cold. Do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> That's not how it works. But it's the same word. <laughs> 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 oh, no, I saw the draft. I mean, there's weird stuff like that. But still, anyway, it's it is also so. Well, I mean, to me, I mean, this a lot of great stuff that this sort of provokes, uh, uh, but. Lang the idea of the sort of new la language that's emerging, but also about so much to me about seeing and kind of in a way opening ourselves up to a different way of seeing and looking at things. I love that uh, this is in some ways I feel like related to uh, great uh, uh, biography of Robert Irwin. The uh, seeing is is uh, forgetting the name of the thing one sees, which I think seeing, is yeah, right. Seeing is forgetting the name of the thing one. Yeah, it's a really, uh, just, I think, profound, beautiful uh, concept. And for me, some some of the things you're talking about are actually like, God, here's this thing that I do every day that I'm looking at every day, but I have, but I, I'm sort of looking at it in a very particular way. And what if we actually just sort of shift a little bit and look at it just a little bit? And data becomes that way to look at it in a slightly different way that and it starts to tell a really different narrative. Uh, I think that's really super interesting. That your behavior has a story. I'm reading yeah. a book now, it's the guy, Sandy Penlin, who's at MIT, and he's looking at um, human data patterns to be able to predict um, like, like whole social interactions in cities just by watching. It's basically throwing big data at, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I mean, I just don't find it scary. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can be worried that something yeah, personally, I'm not worried about it. I mean, you know, I have, uh, you know, I'm quite diligent about using VPN, for example, just because, yeah. but that's for other reasons, you know, so I think the, the general population who don't, don't understand how easy it is to capture, yeah. you know. Right, right. I'm not saying use. your data is not encrypted and that it's right. not personal and it's not private, but you yourself. Sure. Right. I'm not saying data is public. Yeah. And, and what else? Uh, are there other uh, artists that you're really inspired by right now that are using data in different ways? Or uh, you, you referenced another artist at the beginning of this. Are there other people that are doing interesting things to you in the space right now? Well, you know, there's some that keep track of their spending, which is kind of fun. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Money in, money out. Um, yeah. There's people in the quantified self that measure themselves and do things that are a little more in the data visualization category. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of data artists that look at data but that tends to be um, like social data. Yeah. Like Jonathan Harris. Yeah, like Jonathan Harris. Yep. Um, yeah. There's, there's, I, I'm, I personally am really interested in people that are looking and playing with social media. There's a friend of mine, she's doing work, are you really my friend? <laughs> and, yeah, it's Facebook. 
So she's going out and she's photographing every one of her Facebook friends. But it's the notion of relationships in social media. So it's not exactly data, but it's looking at something that we're experiencing all the time and, and like playing it a little bit. It's gotten me to really think about. Yeah. I mean, super interesting. Yeah, it's news. It's like yeah, looking at stuff that you touch all the time. So if you were able to achieve this perfect matrix of all of your data um, and capture it in a moment in time, what would you do with it? Like what? What? How would you? How would you? Like what's the first thing you would start influencing? And like, okay, I'll let you. Understand. Well, no, I understand because people think it has to be like like about productivity. Because people think if I measure my sleep, I try to sleep better. Yeah. Or if I measure my steps, I try to walk more. Because that's kind of the story that the products give. Yeah. I mean, I think if you measure something, you get I weigh, I, you know, I weigh myself every day. And I think the nature of seeing a measurement does make you more aware. For people that weigh themselves all you know every day, I think they hold their weight better. Uh, I think if you measure your sleep, you start to understand what affects it. But I mean, I don't actually consciously try to optimize. Yeah, to optimize it. I I think that the, the nature of knowing is in itself comforting. Do you think that the act of knowing influences future behavior? Like, because I guess what I'm getting at is there's kind of two directions that could go, right? Either you have this perfect like data matrix of all of yourself and then you start influencing it and playing with it and then the predictive ability goes away because you're acting. You, 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 yeah, you fuss with it. Yeah. Um, somebody asked me once, what if I'm kind of depressed and I'm sort of like crazy, you know, what if I could get like a fecal transplant? What if I could get your data? Would that make me feel better? Okay. I did, I thought. Well, that's interesting. I don't, you know, and a lot of this is you, know, you fantasize the positive. I think I've started to, to consider this idea of um, we live in a certain amount of self delusion. We tell ourselves, you know, everybody's above average and we're all nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. We're all great writers. Yeah, we're all great writers. We're all, like, all of that. We're all good. And uh, like, like, we'll be on, right? Everybody's above average. And I think there might be a problem with knowing too much. That anxiety of having to confront the truth might be a little harsh. I mean, I think there's a reason we forget things. We don't see ourselves that close. I mean, there might be just a human need to keep a little distance from the harshness of what we really, what we're really about, what we really do. And start starting to think about that friction of actually, you know, I kept thinking it's really great if I know myself, and then it's like, oh my God, what if I, you know, have to confront this anxiety of who you are? Because the real truth is nobody's really that good all the time. So, uh, there's, there's a problem. I mean, I we don't have problems, yeah. But I think we're kind of a self-adjusting species. For example, when we either, uh, when we eat the apple of the tree, not like yeah. good and evil, like metaphorically, every time you lose that innocence, you like, we always think of ways for creating more innocence and more mystery, you know? And so the more technological development, the more we either put all of that mystery into problems of like social relationships or, you know, after the horrors of World War II, what did we do? We tried to send someone to the moon. Like that's a lot, that's a lot of hope, you know? And so the same science that brought you all of that destruction, you're using to create more mystery. So maybe we take on a different problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, because there was a period where we didn't understand. I mean, really think about it. We didn't understand germs. We didn't understand how people got sick. We didn't understand antibiotics. We didn't, I mean, there's all these things that we didn't understand about sickness. And now we kind of get all that stuff when we move on to other things. Yeah. Um, it just doesn't feel like it's that far off. We're in this. We're in this moment now of having this like explosion of things that are measuring us. It's like, where's it going to go? 
And, and you know, as an artist, I don't have to study it scientifically. I can study it and then make stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we good? Yeah, yeah. It's great to meet you. If I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to meet somebody for drinks like an hour ago. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> for seasons? Thank no, you I for the food. Yeah, no, no, I know I was going to be late. It's fine. So I'm just going to go. But if you got a card and you email me, I'm on Facebook, friend me. I post all the time. I post on Instagram. Come find me. I post about this and every time something, and I write about it a little bit. So you can kind of keep track. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, we've got another you know, hour, so you're welcome to hang out, catch up with one another. Uh, I would like to just maybe have a group. I actually have a couple of sort of questions or things I'd love to kind of brainstorm with you guys about. If, if you're interested, you're obviously welcome to leave if you're got other things to do, but uh, one of the things that we talked about very early on that's kind of coming up uh, as a potential, hey, see you. Thanks for coming. Good to see you, Mark. Yeah, good. Yeah, we should talk. This idea of some kind of uh, art and technology uh, lab or hub, some kind of, I think it could serve multiple functions. Uh, hey, thanks for coming. Yeah, right. Uh, but a space for these sorts of gatherings, but could also be a space for uh, research, for experiments, for projects to, to sort of happen. Um, we're sort of as an organization trying to think about what might something like that look like. We're looking at other examples of this nationally and internationally. But while we're here, I'd love to just uh, do your own sort of thoughts on anything. We could just kind of riff, um, but on things that you think would be especially uh, exciting or meaningful. It can be very little things to just like sheer, uh, shared gear or equipment. Uh, to just like having more, having a, a dedicated space to this kind of thing that you know you could just go there and there'd be other people working on stuff and that would be meaningful. Um, or if that sort of thing is actually the wrong way to be thinking about this, if, if creating some kind of centralized kind of space where this is actually, uh, I don't know, problematic in some way, if, if it's better to be thinking about all these things kind of happening in a little sort of a little spurs and maybe it's better to connect what's happening in a different way. Um, anyway, that's, that's kind of my question. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts or examples of things or things that come to mind. Yeah. We just had kind of a shared space because I think um, I like, there's two aspects to it. There's one where you get in the nitty gritty of it. Uh -huh. Like you really um, get involved with the technology and then there's some people that just love hearing about it. Yeah. You know, so what if that's you great. have this, like a space wherein you have people that will make and do by yeah. themselves, and then once a month you have a place where you can exhibit or uh, something I've yeah. been working on for a while, yep. or bring in a guest speaker to talk on some sort of broader topic. That's right, so it kind of gets in both of those things. There's a, a social mm -hmm. uh, component, there's a, a, the ability to sort of easily demonstrate things, like and it's also a place where stuff is just happening and being made. Yeah, that's great, awesome, yeah. Uh, this is actually my first time showing up, but there's a place that I go to that's like that already, oh, and I noticed that there was actually a slide up there, so I don't know if y'all knew about it or not, but it's called a Tech Shop oh, yeah. over in Round Rock, and I know that there are a couple of artists that work out of there oh, great. using the, all sorts of industrial machines, oh, and they do very, wow. really nice equipment, they give free tours, it's always, it's generally always busy with something, and everything is maintained. Um, it's a really nice place. Really so, big and open. <laughs> so how does this? How does it work? Do you sort of? Is it sort of like a? In, in a way, it's like a co-working space. You sort of pay a, a monthly. Yeah. So you can pay monthly, yearly, or do. I think they have lifetime memberships now, and I think they have. A, a couple months ago, they had something called an artist in residency uh, that lasted last like a couple months. I don't know. If they have a new general manager now, so they might. I'm not sure what's happening. They have a. Uh, I think the members meeting, like the members Q and A happening on the 16th that I'll be showing up to. Um, I, I definitely think that it's something that I feel that artists would benefit a great deal from knowing about and 
checking out at least. Yeah, it's a really awesome. cool place. Yeah, that's great. They they do. Uh, I mean, let me see if I can pull up the date. Awesome. They have a couple of events coming up in the fall. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That's that's wonderful. And what can you tell us a little bit more about like in terms of like equipment and gear and what sort of stuff is there? To be oh yeah. So. Oh. The, the short the short gist of it is a lot. Yeah. Okay. They have a full electronics lab. They have a full metalworking shop, uh, wood shop. Um, they have laser cutters, 3D printers. They have open co-working spaces. They have oh, meeting great. rooms. They have um, some really beefy metalworking machines up to the point of, uh, they have a machine that can cut up to an inch or two of steel. Um, some really intense stuff. They have sheet metal, they have welding, they have some powder coating. Mm -hmm. That's it's, awesome. It's very in-depth and expensive. Last time I checked, uh, the place wasn't very cheap. I don't think, yeah. I think it's like $300 a month. As no, a no. Uh, monthly rate is 125 Okay. And that did go up from 100 I think, a couple months back. Okay. Right. Um, but I think some sort of deal, I've been thinking that some sort of deal could be worked out between artists in Austin and them yeah. to do like a month, monthly or quarterly deal on some sort of Yeah, he was with a group that yeah. a little more power than I do. Yeah, and I know that there are some artists that there already that work out of the end of 24 hours. Oh, that's amazing. That's great. Yeah, it's true. It's pretty cool. You do have to get, take classes or, or, or some sort of courses in order to operate some yeah. higher risk machines. Yeah. Great. Um, but yeah, it's the, the equipment there is, is pretty fantastic. That's great. Did you have something you wanted to comment on? Who was it? Me? Oh, yeah. yeah, there was a similar place in uh, Greenpoint. I used to live in New York, but oh, yeah. uh, I left in 2011 and I kind of kept in touch with what was going on then. Shortly afterwards, it, it just shut down because you know, it was normal what happened. Some, whoever owned the building sold it to some developers. Yeah. The whole thing was over, you know. Yeah. But it was a real loss to the local society, the artistic community, because uh, you know they, they would have rooms a bit like this where you could take classes in anything from when like, you know final cut post shot. Yeah. I did a few on the process, awesome. data modeling stuff, and you could you would pay for those. They weren't super expensive, but the people that were teaching these. You know, they were, they were qualified and they yeah. were great, great uh, lecturers or university students. Or whatever. Yeah. And I think that kind of went a long way to funding the whole uh, the membership and the, the community itself. So you could have real uh, low cost memberships. Mm. People who, you know, definitely would only go, you know, once or twice a month yeah. compared to others who would go five days a week. You know, that's really cool. So, yeah, I think uh, it's. Probably definitely uh, some value in here. Yep. I don't know of anywhere in Austin that offers that. So. Especially maybe a very low sort of cost. Yeah, there's a, the hacker space uh, yeah. in Northeast Austin. Uh -huh. um, it's just a small scale of what you were talking about. Great. It's, it's like a CNC machine, mm -hmm. 3D printers, and some other machines that people have built, yep. tools that people have built. But, yeah. I missed the presentation, the joint presentation on the Madhouse. I mean, I'd be curious if there was a 30 second rundown of what that is. And I don't know if that's being posted at that site that you mentioned. It seemed like there was some collaborative site somewhere in East Austin that, that was. What was this? Madhouse? Something going on in October. Hopefully, there's something that was collaborative. The hack series? Are you talking about Lisa Woods? Um, yeah, it was, yeah, but it was like, uh -huh. Bill said it was going to be collaborated with like her group and your group. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah group, it's so. a hack series. Um, that's, I, I think it's an official, an officially named Madhouse. And that's actually been moved to the first of the year, but it's going to be um, a series of four hacks that will be staged at different places. So it's still kind of being formulated. 
Thank you, yeah. Thank you, John. Yeah. Um, I was also sort of curious um, how, like, it's clear to me how a space like that could work. And I think there's lots of clear benefits to that. I'm also trying to figure out if there's some way to kind of marry with that or couple with that uh, a form of residency that is uh, a bit more concentrated, a bit deeper uh, exploration and research. I mean, maybe it's a six months at a time or uh, a year at a time, but like deep investigations. Maybe it's pairing a particular technologies or particular type of technology with an artist that has that are sharing some real mutual uh, areas of, of interest and really diving deep into something which is different than sort of this this co-working space with shared things that you can learn and do things which I feel like is totally uh, uh, a great uh, service and something that we need but I'm trying to figure out if there's a way to sort of marry that with this and I'm curious you mentioned there was an artist in residency program at the tech shop is that correct or Yeah, yeah. I thought you were, I thought you had mentioned that. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It, there's there's yeah. three people <laughs> that back there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A couple months ago, there was an uh, artist in residency. Um, they changed my general manager, so um, I'm not sure. I mean, it, it would be dumb if they didn't have it, but yeah. I haven't been seeing. So they usually put things out in the entrance. Yeah. Um, display them yeah, and. I haven't been seeing those lately, so I'm yeah. not entirely sure. Uh, the next uh, event that they have is a maker's market uh, this Saturday at 11. Oh, nice. and, uh, the one downside is that it's all the way up over in Round Rock, whereas the hacker space is more on Run Birds. Wow. Yeah. 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 Uh, and it was, this was just about two, a two week long residency uh, exchange between this sort of prominent French theater company director, uh, this uh, technologist from the Bay Area named Barry Threw, who uh, is kind of at the head of a similar kind of movement there. He also works for uh, Digital Obscura, this really cool sort of projection mapping company. Uh, they just did the, I don't know if you guys saw maybe about a month ago, the, the giant projection on the Empire State Building, uh, the, the lion. Uh, anyway, they, they did that. And then uh, the, um, the Pickle Research Center at UT, um, and some of the work that they've been doing uh, uh, actually around uh, data visualization and computer vision. Um, and there, there was basically what the art the theater company in France was trying to do like completely overlapped with what uh, the research center at UT was trying to do with what Barry was trying to do and we brought them together gave them resources and time and space together um, and the, the, the research and the project was basically something that was really mutually beneficial to everyone involved and, like to me that was like a really exciting example of, of bringing different people together that never worked together before to work on um, some common areas of interest um, that would then kind of be sort of have ripples in each of their kind of worlds. Um, I mean, that in a way that kind of came about organically. It was just kind of knowing these different people and be like, oh, uh, you're doing this, you're doing this. This would be a really great opportunity and then seeking out funding for it. But I wonder if there's some kind of, if you could in a way kind of formalize some kind of process or system that kind of is, tr is constantly seeking out these sorts of things. And again, that could be short, they could, it could last a couple of weeks, it could last six months, it could last a year. Um, but just wasn't sure what or how to necessarily do that other than, uh, I don't know, uh, keeping having a lot of ears to the ground and really being aware of what's happening and, and perhaps some resources to make some of that happen. I don't know if that sparks anything for you all, if you have any thoughts or comments about something like that. Yeah, I mean, that's it's a, it's a personal challenge I have as well. Trying to uh, make things happen, like have ideas about, you know, which can be from two different, completely, yeah. you know, different angles. How do you marry them together and bring them into the 
I also like it, I, I also think it's sometimes easy to romanticize collaboration. Like it, it, it can very easily go awry. And it doesn't always work, and maybe it doesn't work as much as it does work. Uh, I'm also really uh, aware of those challenges, but it can also like really be powerful. Um, what what is the with the fuse box stuff on the day to day basis? What that's it. What is uh, yeah? You know, what, what is it all about? Is it Pure performance art. Huh? Yeah. Oh, it's, 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 it's really uh, it's multidisciplinary. It's all different forms. I would say that's sort of more my my background and my history. And so uh, we've kind of I'd say at the center of the work and at the center of our festival. And originally, the festival was really the only thing we did. Um, and at the center of it was the live event. I think we were really interested in exploring the live event. Um, and so that was. But that uh, contained many different things, from performance to installations that had a sort of live component. Um, uh, but I think we were we're equally. I think we've always been interested in in uh, this conversation across different art forms. I think for me, it's something really uh, intrinsically linked to my understanding of creativity. Uh, that is tied to encountering ideas that are that are outside of my sphere, um, and so we wanted to create a festival that was intentionally bringing artists from really different backgrounds and perspectives together. Sometimes they're actually working together, uh, and the work itself is very hybrid. Sometimes they're not working together, but their work is being uh, presented in proximity with one another to create these kind of unlikely and expect unexpected kind of encounters. Um, and to me, that also starts to, it's one of the things that I just love about festivals. Uh, like a festival isn't seeing one thing, it's actually seeing two or three or four or five or ten things. And so you kind of, in a way, festivals are inherently these kind of hybrid things. Even a music festival, you're hearing these different. Um, so we, we just kind of wanted to kind of lean into that. Um, we're uh, starting to think about other types of programming year-round. We're starting to look at a residency program that will potentially exist year-round. Uh, we started this, this meetup group you know, earlier this year. I think we've always done projects that have featured art and technology and explored that. I think we wanted to create a specific series that really dedicated to that exploration. And I think within that, we're, we're interested in a whole range of, uh, I think, you know, we're interested in the, the infinite possibilities of new technology, what we do with it, and we're also interested in, in uh, you know, exploring really ubiquitous and mundane everyday technologies and, and holding up a magnifying glass just to look at our ourselves and our relationship to technology. Um, I think if you zoom out, um, I think ultimately we, we like to think of our organization and our festival as a, as a platform for looking at and engaging with contemporary culture. What does it mean to be alive in the world today? Um, and we felt like it was really difficult to do that and not be dealing with technology in some shape or fashion because we're all kind of swimming with it and dancing with it. Um, and it was also a way to bring these, in some way, I think these two really, in my mind, kind of defining communities of Austin, uh, the arts and creative industries and technology uh, together. There's obviously a lot of overlap and uh, blurriness there anyway. Yeah. Um, when is the festival? It's in April. Oh. Yeah, it'll be in early April. It'll be five days this year. It's, it's traditionally been 12 days, but we're kind of condensing it. Okay. And it happens at different locations. Uh, we use, we have stuff at theaters and galleries and clubs and museums, um, but we also often do a lot of site-based work. Um, so we've done stuff on bridges and in alleyways and whole neighborhoods have become sites for concerts. Um, I did think it, this was, I guess this was kind of my other, my second question that I wanted to put uh, to the group was also thinking about how we as a community, uh, as a group, um, could potentially uh, work on something together uh, as part of the festival. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be like one single group project, it could be a series of things uh, or happenings or a showcase of some sort or a convening of some sort. Uh, or maybe it's just bringing in one kind of really awesome speaker that we were all really excited by. But um, it is an opportunity, I think, to, to do something. It's certainly when we have most of our resources in motion and in play, and there's a lot of people, um, other artists and curators and thinkers and writers here 
um, at that time. And so to me, it's also just fun to think about it for something that we as a group, uh, it'd be fun for us to do. Uh, it could be a hack, it could be a group show, it could be any number of things. Um, so that's just something to be thinking about. Um, you can shoot me an email or um, whatever, you can post up on the, on the Meetup group site. Um, yeah, the idea, I mean, there's a lot to, um, to be uh, encouraged by the, 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 you know, the last two that I've seen. I mean, they're, they're really they're great to, to listen to the artists presenting what they're working on and reasons why and it's kind of inspiring yeah. to, to see. Yeah, and we're trying to find also artists and people that are working in a space that are working in really different areas of this, this arena um, so that we can really kind of better understand the, the breadth of ideas that are being explored right now. Um, certainly I feel like data is a big sort of pool and hey, Sorry, good to see you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, um, what if it was a group project? Um, I mean, it's about the meetup, and I think it's really, I think it's so cool that you have all of these different people coming in and speaking about them, and I would like others to know. Yeah. And maybe a group project would be like, some of us pick our favorite speakers and almost do, I'm not going to say book report, but that's the only thing that's coming to mind, it's kind of tired right now, but <laughs> even just like a little spiel about that person, a couple of slides, or bringing in you know, some printed pieces of what they've done. It's sort of like you're reporting on that artist to a larger audience or an audience that wouldn't necessarily come into a meetup. Yeah. I mean, I, when I, I talk about the speakers when I go to work. The next day, I give them a little presentation. It's super fun. They wouldn't come here. They love getting the information. They also like hearing me speak. And actually, I really like speaking. I get kind of performative with it. <laughs> it's fun, you know? So that might be something, too. As part of this. The, the, yeah, this the, meetup. Yeah. Like, you choose, you know, one or two or whatever artists that, it. you know, you really liked. And you do your own, do your own presentation about them. You're not rehashing necessarily what they said. You could do some exploration yourself into what they've done, but like this was the meetup at such and such time. I was there. This is what I liked about it. This is what I want you to know about this artist. You know, it's nice. It's a nice sharing thing to do. You kind of round up every few months. It's like the, your takeaway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but if it was a bunch of us, you know, over time. So this is happening in April, right? So you're talking yeah. about doing something in April. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's going to be like what six months worth of. Speakers, so you've got six speakers, you know. You know, maybe we divide out into teams or you know, one person does their own thing. Maybe I like the idea of even a neighborhood like staging different spots mm -hmm. in a place. That's cool. You know, and you're talking about your person. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's I do love the uh, uh, I mean I love hearing about what you know, excites people. Well, what, yeah, and what's your interpretation of, totally of this? Super fun. Yeah. You know, you're uh, taking their art, now you're turning it into your art. Mm -hmm. That's kind of cool. Totally not their art. You should be doing that with it. Yeah. On that chain of thought, I mean, the last two uh, presentations here, you could take uh, what Jao was doing, uh, project what uh, Laurie was doing. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. So you presented her art in a different yeah. art form. Oh, it's super interesting. Yeah. Projected on a uh, building or mm -hmm. you know, sculpture yeah. or what have you. Combined with, you know, whatever the next person's going to talk about. Yeah. yeah, that's a really cool idea. I also wonder if there's uh, maybe every couple of months, uh, we just build it into this group if we wanted to just meet up. In a way, I feel like this speaks to what you're talking about. So I wonder if there's also just more of a built in opportunity for everyone here to just share a couple of artists and projects that we haven't talked about. Uh, that in a way, we all have kind of little research assignments. Uh, sort of a show and tell. Yeah. Like, let's just, lead off with a little show and tell, some share things. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. It's encouraging. It's maybe, I mean, I guess it could be about you your own work. You open it up that way. Just say, does yeah. everybody have anything they'd like to do? <laughs> You know, start that way. Yeah, and uh -huh. you know, maybe it's 
more than anything, it's just a way for us to continue to kind of expand our, our knowledge of, of what's happening here and what's happening uh, elsewhere. Thanks. Hey, thanks for coming. Good to see you. Uh, and along those lines, I also will, like if there are artists or guest speakers that you think would be great for this, please let us know. You can just send me an email or post something on the on the meetup site. I would love welcome suggestions. Uh, I don't know. That's that's what I got. Does <laughs> so anyone have anything they'd like to share? Yes. Yeah. You guys know Jonathan Harris's work? Um, yeah, he's awesome. Uh, you should check out his, he has a, a project called We Feel Fine. I think the, the website is wefeelfine.org. Um, basically, uh, in, in pulling from blog sites all over the world anytime someone uses the phrase, I feel. Um, and so from for any given moment, you can take a snapshot of like what the world is feeling at any moment. And you can do like, like you can do specific sort of parameters like when it's raining in Sao Paulo, I want to know what like men under the age of 40 are feeling. And it like pulls up all these blog entries uh, that contain that phrase and the rest of the sentence. And there's all these different sort of visualizations that you can sort of experience uh, these feelings. In. But I, I I feel like the project is like super profound to spend, uh, you know, large chunks of time watching this. It's, it's really beautiful and profound. He also did. I think MoMA commissioned him to do uh, it's similar, a similar project, but he's mining uh, online dating sites um, and sort of creating these really sort of uh, wonderful portraits. In a way, it's very similar to our work in a way. It's real sort of snapshots of us as a people. It's, of course, it's dealing with large volumes of, of people's data. Um, he's someone that I think is doing really especially awesome work. There was also this project in New York a couple of years ago that was uh, called Z. Um, that was um, uh, sort of this very immersive installation. Uh, you are led into this, but first of all, you have to sign all these kind of waivers. <laughs> and, uh, you're led, I think it's like 16 people at a time, and they have this high density fog, and they hit it with these uh, strobe lights that are timed at just the right point. And basically, you start having your own hallucinations on the like, on like the red of your eye. It's, and so like everyone is literally tripping, uh, but like very specific, like <laughs> you're seeing specific things that they have sort of um, figured out how to make you see, but there's like actually nothing in the space other than fog and strobe lights. <laughs> but uh, it's, you should check with my other, like, there are amazing interviews with people who've just seen it and they're like trying to describe what just happened to them. Uh, but it was kind of this life changing, uh, crazy installation. Uh, people did, actually I had a friend of mine who uh, totally fainted. And then, and they didn't know, like, we were like outside, and we were like, you know, where's Karen? And like, she was like passed out in the fog. Really? It was, it was too much for her. It was too much. Yeah. <laughs> Overdose. Oh man, that's funny, but it's kind of not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're bored. I love my friend. Good for us to also just think we maybe a couple of meetups ago we started to track this, but also we could uh, just to kind of track other uh, gatherings, other festivals, conferences that are kind of in the space nationally. I know there's a lot of this work is happening at the university level. You know, MIT has a really amazing lab. Uh, there's a great uh, several things happening in the Bay Area. Uh, there's a cool convening in Minneapolis. Uh, there's a great oh, Electra and Mutech are two things that happen in Montreal every year. Mutech is an electronic music festival, and Electra is really a digital art uh, festival. And they happen around the same time. Um, there's some amazing work that happens um, there every year. Um, so I think that would just be a nice resource for us. Um, 
to kind of know what's happening nationally and internationally in this space. And that's also a great way to start kind of learning about others, you know, one sort of step into, the, into those worlds, you really get a sense of who some of these other artists are. Um, I, I think, uh, I mean, I've only been here for a few months, but uh, you know, I've, I've lived in uh, Amsterdam, Paris, Manchester, but all over, you know, many European cities and New York as well. I think uh, the electronic music scene in those cities is well, developing as well, of course, but, yeah. you know, it's so, it's so far uh, ahead. Of, yeah. I mean, it's always been that way, actually. Yeah. You know, America's always been kind of, somewhat, maybe, you know, in some respects, 20 years. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's not, I'm not saying that's, uh, I'm not dissing America. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I've oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like moved from, uh, from England when I was 15 to Alabama. Oh, wow. 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 I think when I, when I moved to New York, I could see it just starting to catch on, you know, whether it was good nights, um, and, and this weekend there's a good festival up in the Catskills called Sustain Release, and it's only the second year of it. Um, and what, what's interesting about it this year is uh, they're not finding anybody in Europe or anywhere else. It's predominantly American artists and DJs that are playing it. I think that's quite an interesting shift. That's really cool. Um, that's only that's New York, right? It's yeah. not. Yeah. It's not here. And I think there's there are people here who would like a, a platform to, to do it. And I've been to a, a few events, and I'm you know, pretty convinced that there's definitely talent here mm -hmm. and, and an interest. Um, and you mean, when you say here, do you mean specifically in Austin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And so, who, like, uh, Exploded Drawing, have you been to any of their events? No, I haven't. I don't know what that is. It's a kind of, yeah, I don't know, periodic electronic music uh, and sort of projection oh, yeah. event. Uh, exploded Drawing. Yeah, oh, yeah, but it's, it doesn't really happen on a regular, just kind of periodically yeah. <laughs> it happens. Yeah, I think, you know, what, what, I'm, what I'm, what I've seen anywhere, there's a great DIY scene yeah. happening, you know, yeah. um, which is which is cool, you know, it's almost underground. Yeah. But it's, it's quite hard to keep track of what's going on. Mm. You know, it's quite spurious, I think. Yeah. Um, are, are, there, there, are there venues or places? Or? Uh, yeah, it's scattered, you know, like I say, I mean, there's a cool night that's been going on maybe three or four times now. On a monthly basis at the Tamale House. <laughs> Tamale House East? Yeah, oh, which is yes. not a club at all, right? Yeah, yeah. But the guys just ship the tables out and then, you know, it's like a mini rave there on awesome. a Saturday night. Really? Yeah. Ooh, fun. You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> cool. I mean, the guys are in the restaurant <laughs> serving liquor. Yeah. And, you know, they must be making decent money and oh, what have you. But, you know, they're very strict on it being over at one o'clock. Yes. They don't have a license past that point, okay. nor is it a club. So yeah. I don't know if, how much longer they'll get away with doing that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but the, you know, there's enough attendance. Yeah, wow. I think cool. um, it would be great if you did like a miniature new tech here, yeah. or you know, sauna, to where it's yeah, it's, you know, kind of a combination of electronic and visual art. Yeah. And, some crossover acts, of course. Hey, thanks for coming. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, that's great. I wonder what, you know, that's in some ways, I feel like that's partially what Andrea and Prototype have been Protos. Proto, Protos, yes. Okay, thank you. have been trying to do. Um, I should, we should check in with her and see what she's got cooking. Okay. She's, she's ramping up to 2016. Great. Yeah, it's on the website, so. 
Credits. It's she runs um, a website. It's Custable. So I'm not sure when it's happening in 2016, but that's the plans. I think it's gonna. There's so many people that are moving here from yeah. all over, yeah, yeah. you know, America, different parts of the world that it's expanding to become more dominant. Yeah, yeah, totally. It was really, I was really, I guess last year I was at New Tech when Electra was going on, and I thought that was really exciting. They could bring the resources of both sort of platforms together. It was a biennial that Electra was doing. It was some awesome work. It was really good. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I've been wanting to go to New Tech for a while, but the timing just never worked out. Yeah. I guess, I guess it plays similar to Sonar in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, although that's become so huge now that it's completely different. To what yeah. said. We should we should take a group field trip there. Everyone <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just put this on the calendar. We're going to Montreal. We have these fundraisers. <laughs> yeah. It's in like early late May, early June. <laughs> yeah. It's a lovely time to be in Montreal. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. in a good mood. Yeah. No ice. Oh, so, yeah. Um, that'd be really fun. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, we could have a bake sale. Uh huh. Lots of them. <laughs> Lots of them. <laughs> uh, well, all right. You guys, any other brilliant ideas, comments? Are you going to start opening up the meetup with? Asking people to share. You can guide that, guide that yeah. process, make like that happen. I think that's great. I think yeah. that's a great idea. I mean, we need sort like, of prompt you know, them. Give yeah. them some prompts. You know, what have you read this week that really interested you that has to do with our technology? I love Give it. them prompts. I love it. I think that's great. Uh, yeah, examples of work, mm -hmm. things you've been thinking about, things you've read or seen mm -hmm. recently. Mm -hmm. It would give everyone a little prompt a week out. It's like, hey, remember to come. With some ideas and things that you're thinking about. Um, I don't know, that's just always one of my favorite things is just shoot my shit with people about things they're into right now and thinking about. So it seems like that's like such a natural thing for a meetup to be about anyway. So, um, yeah. Well, great. Well, thanks very much. I really appreciate you all coming. It's good to see you and do it again next time. Thank you. Thanks for the